Are you ready to turn your best ideas into a thriving online business? Introducing Shopify, your no excuses business partner. You might not realize, but our podcast, More Than Mammies, it's a business. And we started it, of course, to talk about maternity, not to become an e-commerce expert. So yeah, we needed some help selling our merch and getting our store up and running. Another sale. Shopify is a commerce platform revolutionizing millions of businesses worldwide. No matter if you are a garage entrepreneur or a big business, Shopify is the only tool you need to start and grow your business without the struggle. With Shopify single dashboard, you can manage orders, shipping, and payments from anywhere, giving you the insights you need wherever you are. Sign up for $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash sonoro or lowercase. Go to shopify.com slash sonoro to take your business to the next level today. Shopify.com slash sonoro. Welcome to episode 55 of the Brown and Black Podcast. My name is Jack Rico. And I'm Mike Sargent. And every week we take a look at race and pop culture through a brown and black lens. Mike, we got a great interview today. This is probably one of the most memorable interviews we've done in a while, huh? For sure. Listen, I, like I'm ready to just do a show with those two guys. Like we should <laughs> the brown and brown and black and black show. I'm down with that. <laughs> exactly. So who we're interviewing uh, today is CJ Hunt and Roy Wood Jr., who both work at The Daily Show. And they have a new film, a new documentary film that's already out on PBS and POV.org. It's called The Neutral Ground. It is amazing in 2015, I'm fighting Robert E. Lee. This is, oh, it's almost hilarious. Those statues never should have been erected. The South lost. Let's take down these statutes and put them in a place of proper remembrance, not reverence. Four monuments to the Confederacy are set to come down in New Orleans. The vote is considered one of the most sweeping moves by a U.S. city to cut ties with Confederate history. But that's not what happened. That's not what happened. Backlash over a plan to remove these prominent monuments has led to death threats, intimidation, and even the intentional torching of a contractor's Lamborghini. We're live out here at the Jeff Davis Monument. It is extremely chaotic right now. We cannot have reconciliation without truth. Okay. Here we go. This, for me, is the closest we can get to the actual Confederacy. Somebody is going to abuse the institution. People don't always take care of their objects well. Right. Including when that object is a person. Including when it's a person. Yeah. We have intentionally misrepresented this history to our own citizens on purpose. These people who are really bigoted, I bet we could just change their minds. <laughs> <laughs> why, why do you think that? I don't know. Because may I have. Why do you hold that hope out? That illusion? These stories are coming out. So I think we're in a different portal of time that these things are not gonna be swept under the rug any longer. And Mike, for you, what, what is the premise of this documentary? Well, I think the premise of the documentary or, or what he started out with, and I think this happens a lot with documentaries, was to kind of document what was going on. Why are people so dead set against these white supremacy monuments, especially in this specific area where he went in New Orleans. What's the history? Why do people want these statues to be there considering what they mean? But what he really does is find out not only what they mean, we all know what it means to black folks, but why do white folks want to keep this? And what do they think these statues mean? Right. And CJ directed it. He also stars in it. When I say stars, he's the protagonist of this because it's his idea. Roy Wood Jr. Um, is an executive producer of this film. And it's part investigative journalism, part humorous. And think of it, you know, like if Jon Stewart were to do something, this is that feel. Like it's serious, but with moments of... Uh, hilarity because white supremacy at the end of the day is so damn absurd you gotta laugh at it right Mike? 
it is one part investigative journalism. It is one part humorous or comedy, but it's also another third of it is history. It presents history, but contextualizes it at the same time. And that's not an easy thing to do. No, it's definitely not. But this is more than just about monuments. It's about the self-exploration of CJ as a black Filipino in America and what it feels like to not be fully black, but then to be of mixed race, but then at the same time to be black and to be black within America and the black experience of that, you know, historically. And so it's a self-exploration of who he is and his identity to a certain extent. If you see CJ, and I suggest you look him up and you look up Neutral Ground, maybe even before you listen to this podcast, and you don't really know what CJ is. You know, black Filipino, to most people, they think he's Latino. But, I thought he was Latino. So you're Latino, you thought he was Latino. Black people probably think he's Latino too, but for a lot of white people, it's a different thing. It allowed him access, and I think in many ways, like this film does in its history, history lesson, it disarmed a lot of white folks who are white supremacists, and allowed them to be very, very frank with him. And we got to talk about Hollywood's influence in one of the greatest stories ever told by the South, which is the Lost Cause. The Lost Cause could be visually seen in Gone with the Wind. And that Lost Cause is, I think, today what a lot of Americans are fighting for, especially in the South. But Hollywood, to a certain extent, was propagating this white supremacy in just subtle ways that weren't violent or necessarily criminal, but that were a part of the lexicon and a part of the lifestyle of being an American. Dude, I think you're being too kind. I, I, I wouldn't say uh, it, it. I think Hollywood is extraordinarily culpable in the rewriting of history. You know, the very notion of, uh, let's just say, a Western you know, with cowboys. No white man was ever called a cowboy in the West. Boys was a term only used for black people, black men. They were always called boys, no matter what age they were. So a cowboy, the white cowboy would have been a cattleman. The entire mythos is a complete Hollywood propagation. So to me, this definitely is part of changing that. First of all, CJ, thank you very much, and welcome to the Brown and Black podcast. My name is Jack Rico. This is Mike Sargent. We got a chance to see the neutral ground. And interestingly enough, one of the reasons I said yes was because I thought you were Latino. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because you look like a Latino. I know. Welcome to everyone who sees me on the street. Like, you and I look like we could be related. I saw you on the podcast, and I was like, yeah, 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 that's my brother. <laughs> That's my, my brother, yeah. Mike, what about you? When you saw it, were you like, this is this is a Dominican? I live like in Harlem, uh, like up on like a hundred in the hundred and fifties. So it's very Dominican. You could easily blend right in. Let me just say that. For those who cannot see me through your radio, my my mom was Filipino, my dad is black. So I just spend most of my time looking functionally Dominican. Um, <laughs> and that definitely surfaced in this film of you know, there, there are some very unsafe places that I go in this film, both emotionally unsafe and physically unsafe. Um, and I do recognize that sometimes the things that we captured of folks talking to me, it is clear based on what they are saying that they do not understand they're talking to a black person. You know, when, when one of those neo-Confederates is like, the blacks, the blacks are still on the plantation because they're controlled by the Democratic Party. It's like, bro, I don't know if you you know that you're talking to a black man. And I think mixed people in America have that experience all the time. Can we unpack that and just catch up with Roy really quick about your look, which is not, I guess, a traditional black look. Can you unpack that for me? And how much does that play into The Neutral Ground, the movie that you guys did? I, I, 
I, you know, I need 82 minutes to unpack that. I, I was, I'm laughing at how diplomatic just no one's ever said to me, you know, you don't look traditionally black. Um, and I, and I, it is not inaccurate. CJ is black, but he's at the family reunion and the old folks are going to go, well, what is you? <laughs> Where are your people if from? You black. <laughs> we know what you is, but specifically, baby, what, who are your people is? <laughs> That's how I know. That's how I know when someone's going over it. You know, white white people when they're going over it, and their head would just be like, "Where are you from?" But black folks would be like, "Who are your people? Wh where where are they from?" You know, like I, I can tell when people are making that calculation. But for this film, I think it allowed me a certain level of safety mm. and a certain level of white racists dropping their guard. I think the success of this film besides spotlighting black resistance, besides spotlighting, you know, the insanity of, of how long white supremacy makes democracy wait. I think the success of this film is how many snapshots we got of just naked white supremacy, whiteness in its natural element. And, and I think some folks are like, well, I'm just talking to this sweet little Mexican boy. Um, and they may not have said the things they said on camera, if, if I if I looked more more unquestionably black, I, I think that's an important part of it. You know, when you're doing these types of pieces, like it's it's part of the reason why at the Daily Show we send Jordan Klepper to talk to all of them Trump supporters. He's going to get a different sauce. It, it's just going to be a different. The energy is just going to be different. And I think what CJ was able to do, which is so beautiful in this piece, is because the people are disarmed by not fully knowing what. The, the, mm -hmm. it made the conversation less guarded and they were less defensive, which means they were more open, which gives CJ the opportunity to swoop in and really attack those curiosities that that brings up. Because I really feel like he was able to get something that a lot of other people wouldn't have necessarily been able to to like minority like cj is like right around there with don lemon where i know you're black but you make me feel good so i'm gonna <laughs> talk to you mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know yeah. like and, and i i'm saying that jokingly but there's something comforting in that and that and it really gave him a strategic advantage because they didn't realize that cj's father is from the struggle <laughs> he is one of the <laughs> realest the og yeah i love your dad i gotta tell you Ooh. i love your oh, dad yeah. That's him. He's been, you know, he's been critical race theory since the 70s. And I think he might be recognizable to black and mixed kids who grew up with, you know, a dad who moved them to the white suburbs, that there's a balancing act that I think some of those dads do that are like, damn, you are not getting blackness in our world. So I have to really bring the history at the breakfast table. And I, I think that's what folks are getting from that scene. I'm aware that the genre that I'm in, documentaries where a person grabs a microphone and runs into dangerous places and it's like so you believe some bullshit you know like that's a genre <laughs> of that's a genre of white men you know that that's that's the michael moores and that's the morgan spurlocks you know and there's not as big of a cost for them in in going into those spaces and as much as i'm privileged by having sort of an ambiguous look that doesn't mean the cost to my soul is different <laughs> you know that doesn't mean that i'm not spending the whole time in the sunken place of having to smile to neo-confederate folks who want to tell me that slavery was was not a bad time or saying the n-word off mic or camping out in these spaces going to charlottesville chasing down white supremacy and then living with white supremacy in all these documents so it it, it is a I don't want to make it sound like, ooh, it, it's very easy because I look brownish. It's like people let down their guard, but the cost internally is absolutely the same. And I know I'm not supposed to be asking you no questions right now, bro. Let's go. Let's go. You and me just interviewing each other. <laughs> How you doing, Roy? I'm the new co-host that just got added. I just got hired on. Oh, on snap. You guys didn't realize we could Ooh. do our own black and brown. This is the yeah. takeover. <laughs> yeah. Jack, Jack, Jackie hit me up. I did all the paperwork. I never asked you this, man. How do you not get mad? I'm gonna be honest. I be on them field pieces for two days. I be ready to cuss people out by the end of day two, day three. How did you deal with your mentals, bro? like just absorbing white supremacy for four or five years straight. Actors always talk about when they inhabit, like there's been this myth about Heath Ledger that he was with the Joker for so long that supposedly it led him to 
his death, even though I think that's greatly exaggerated. But in your case, this is real, man. This is not inhabiting a fictitious character. This is white supremacy. So great question. Yeah, yeah, you're hired, Roy. <laughs> Roy, you're a great interviewer. You have a great voice. Forget Mike's voice. I think all the time about one of the greats, Ava DuVernay, she, in talking about 13th, she talks about this one piece of footage. And if you've seen the film, you, you know this footage of, it's a piece of footage of a black man getting uh, pushed around by a white mob. And he's in a suit and he's got a top hat and the hat keeps falling off. And he keeps putting, picking up the hat and putting it back on. And for her, it was really important to have that scene because there's something about the strength and the courage of somebody who is who is having their life threatened. You know, it's just important for him to put his hat back on. And she talked about trying to take care of her audience by not showing them kill him seconds later. And she talked about having to detox on her own from the damage just that that scene and scenes like that actually did to her psyche. And to be honest, I haven't taken that space yet. You know, it, it's been go, go, go. And partly because white supremacy keeps having these sequels, keeps being like, and now we're in Charlottesville, keep filming. And now we're attacking the Capitol, change the end. You know, like because white supremacy is nonstop, I haven't taken that time. And it's interesting you asked today because a few hours before this, I was making lunch and watching footage of the Capitol riot hearings. So we're going to see some of what our witnesses saw on January 6th but please be advised that it contains graphic images and strong language, which many may find disturbing. So many of the people I put my life at risk to defend are downplaying or outright denying what happened. Multiple capital injuries, multiple capital injuries. <laughs> I feel like I went to hell and back to protect them and the people in this room. They've got the gallows set outside the Capitol building. It's time to start fucking using them. He'll be back, he warns us. It's just chilling. And, and watching the extended footage of those fools attacking the Capitol. And, you know, we have a day job on The Daily Show where we joke about this stuff. But I, for the first time, I, I broke down in my kitchen and sat on the floor and just was weeping. And that is because I think there is something that I have not dealt with about what Charlottesville and, and all of this white supremacy does when it builds up inside you. And as a documentarian, you're like, I must capture it. I must capture it. We'll work it in the edit. But you do not think about the thing that Ava's talking about. It's like, yeah, but you are also holding that in you. And you know, so all of a sudden, some footage of white supremacists attacking the Capitol that sounds exactly like Charlottesville and feels exactly like the same is sending me to some other place. I often feel, and, and Jack probably has heard me say that, you know, comedy and, and science fiction and horror have something in common in that they, you know, they can talk about the human condition and maybe obscure it a bit. And you can say more. To approach a topic like this and to include and keep all the humor that you have about it, I, I'm convinced more and more that the best way to teach and educate is through something entertaining. But I'm also curious your thoughts as comedians about comedy and truth, how they work together, and especially exposing really unpleasant truths. A good friend of mine, comedian Mike Birbiglia, he said something that's always stuck with me in that jokes only work when we all agree on the premise. And the thing that's starting the fissure that I'm starting to see in our society now is that we don't even necessarily agree on what the truth is. And so that is what's making it harder. I can't speak for sci-fi because sci-fi gets to draw, they get to set up a different world with different rules and then parallel it to us. So sci-fi to me is a little bit, it's able to reach as many, if not more, because you set up new rules that everyone agrees upon. Where comedy, the comedy that I like at least, is rooted in the reality that we already share. So if I go on stage and go, yeah, bop, 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 CDC, the mask, wearing a mask, it's okay to wear. If somebody in the audience don't rock with masks or they think masks are stupid and they think I'm a sheep for wearing a mask, you're not gonna, you don't even care about what I'm gonna say on the other, on the other side of that. So I think that's probably what's made it more difficult 
but that also is what makes it more rewarding when you're able to thread that needle. And I think that's the thing that really, that's what I still enjoy on the daily show. You know, it, 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 to me, it is a little bit more difficult, but you know, when you're able to capture that tone in the right way, it's, it's magical. And I'm sorry to keep throwing praise on CJ, but this is something that, you know, a lot of people have died for and are still dying for and to still be able to tonally find that, that like, even if you agree with the Confederacy, all right, let me just hear this out a little bit. Let me see what this guy, like it's the, it's the perfect type of doc where even if you don't agree with the premise, you're still going to be on board with it. Originally, the basic format is let's put sugar in the medicine. That's the original reason that jokes are in this throughout the conversation I had multiple times with, with my producing partner, Darcy, with Roy, with my editor was how do we keep white folks in their seats for 82 minutes? Folks who grew up with the white Southerners who grew up with the lost cause, you know, middle of the road, white folks, liberal whites who are like, oh God, now they're talking about the North teens who are looking at pictures of lynchings in this film. So the whole time I'm like, how do we build the machine so that when the temperature gets too hot, we, we let the steam off a little bit. So white folks don't feel like they, they got to get up and get some air that, that we keep them in their seat. So that's, that's part of why certain jokes are in there. You know, that's why we're right before you hear Alexander Stevens's true thoughts about slavery being the cornerstone we're laughing about his ashy ass lips you know like like that's the reason that some of those jokes are in there but i've only recently come to this thing that i think mike is saying which is it's not just that we're hiding the ball or or sweetening the medicine i think comedy is a language uniquely suited for expressing certain frequencies of horror you know, it's like some of us have friends who only curse in other languages because they're like, I, I, if when I'm really mad, I got to go to French because this is, it doesn't sound right in English. This is the only way I can express certain levels of outrage. And I think it's the same with, with comedy that, you know, there are moments in the film where you go, where something so horrific or something so ignorant happens where you're like, I have no words. I have no words. And that is when we use a joke and coming from The Daily Show and, and working with folks who I think are legends like Roy and working in a language where it's you know a lot about jokes per minute. My big insecurity in making this film was, dang, it's not funny enough. It's not funny enough. And then when the first reviews came in and are like, this film is actually funny or this film is occasionally funny or using words like this film is wry or deadpan. To me as a comedian, I'm like, that's not funny. That, 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 that doesn't bang like comedy, that, that doesn't hit. But what I'm realizing is that all the reviews that are like, this film is deeply harrowing and are able to talk about levels of horror that I've only talked about with other Black people, I'm realizing that they were able to absorb that because the comedy is letting it get into their bloodstream. The comedy is like being able to package a type of horror that they otherwise don't have capacity for. When I look at the neutral ground, I'm also looking at the bigger picture context here, which is that this is a film about the power of storytelling and about how the narrative is controlled. And whoever controls the narrative controls history. And whoever controls history controls the power. So when you look at it like this, can you explain to me how the lost cause became the American ideology almost for the whole world? Why was this story one of the greatest stories ever told. You're, I mean, you're right. It's, it's the stickiest story that we have in America besides Columbus discovered America, right? You know, it's like in 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue is number one. And number two is it was about states' rights. There's no other <laughs> stickier story that's, that's stuck around. Part of, part of it is- I, <laughs> oh, geez, This ain't nothing but a spinoff. <laughs> yeah, that's true, that's from true. the Columbus shit. It's in right, the same right. universe. It's in the white supremacy universe. Exactly. <laughs> it's the sequel. Exactly. <laughs> the metaverse. Exactly. Right, right. The white culture metaverse. Yes. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. We, we have, you know, we're on number seven right now. I mean, <laughs> you're watching the Capitol riot and you're like, wasn't this number two? And it's like, no, this is number 12. Um, but yeah, I mean, Roy and I joked in the edit about if I lost a fight 
and someone gave me the opportunity to tell the story of that fight, you bet I'm going to take some liberties, you know? And I, I think, I think it throws it on, you know, everyone wants to say the winners write history. And so how did the Confederacy? And it's like, I, I love this moment right now because it's like, because the Confederacy did not lose. The Confederacy lost on the battlefield, but all of their insurrectionists didn't get punished. These folks returned to Congress. These folks became in New Orleans, two, two ex-Confederates who were members of the White League out killing police officers in the street and attacking the biracial government. They became the mayor and they became the state Supreme Court justice. And those two men are in the documents dedicating the Lee Monument. All of their all of their worst criminals became the leaders of these governments and built monuments to their own story, right? Like if the Capitol rioters tomorrow got a hundred thousand dollars together and put up a monument, it would be insane to us the idea that 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 monument could stay up long enough that people would forget that that's just a version of the story. But when it comes to civil war, everyone forgets that that was just a weird version that the losers spun when they were able to get back in power. Wow. The, the notion of criminals rising to power seems familiar hmm. somehow. Weird. Uh, Where did we? Uh, it seems strange. weird, you know, and 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 no accountability. Where did we huh? Do that? Um, <laughs> huh? And in insurrectionists, insurrectionists being branded yeah, as wait, patriots. Wait, Where does that? I heard this before. <laughs> so the thing, the thing that was most disappointing, like to CJ's point, is that we didn't even really even get to really delve into critical race theory and how the lie is being doubled down upon. Like we was just, hey, would you mind just talking about some of the black history? Nope. Matter of fact, we taking out all the black history that was in there just for asking you, bastard. <laughs> <laughs> and the Latino history. Yes. And so many other cultures yes. history, erasing us essentially from reality. That's exactly it. Bro. Gaslighting all of us. It is gaslighting by legislation. Look, like these numbers may have changed, but the last time I looked in July, 14 states have proposed bills for a uh, voter disenfranchisement, all right? 14 states. 10 of those same states have also tried to pass critical race theory bans. A number of those same states have also passed like anti-trans uh, legislation. So you are absolutely right. This is gaslighting by legislation. They are tailoring a racial harm against a community and then depriving us of the legal language to describe what has been done to us. That's how they gutted the voting rights law. And that is what is happening right now. Critical race theory bans, or as I call them, dumb, dumb laws, because they're trying to make our kids dumb. Um, these are not just like a strategy to win an election. They are gutting civil rights, that, and, and that's what's up. So then tell me about pop culture's role in propagating the lost cause white supremacy throughout America. When you think of the glorious South, what are you thinking of? Well, hey, y'all, little lemonade, little sweet tea. I do declare. Yeah, oh, I do declare. And the, and, the, and the dresses, you're not thinking of a stinking place where most white people are desperately poor and the elite has run in an, an entire society that they've gotten these poor whites to buy into that's built on rape and murder and selling to people. You're not thinking, that's, that's the real South. But we think that it was this grand place with these verandas and the, and the, and the old live oak trees. Like we think of that because of pop culture. We think of that because of Gone with the Wind. We think of that because of, you know, Shirley Temple's The Littlest Rebel. Like all of these things are pop culture. And guess what? Guess where they were made? They were made in the North. Birth of a Nation was shot in LA. So, I mean, I think that's the crime, right? Like, this is a true crime where we're like, who put this shit in the history? Who, 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 took, who broke in the vault of history, took the real thing, replaced it with the forgery? And then you realize the whole time, the inside man is white northerners. Most people get their opinions from somebody else. Most people get their knowledge, history from movies or TV or maybe even Twitter. But the only way to combat pop culture, the only way to combat that type of you know, dissemination of information or misinformation is with 
documentaries is with doing the same thing. So I want to know your thoughts on, uh, especially because, you know, you're, you're documentary filmmakers now. And I feel we're in the age of the documentary. You know, we all know the news is biased depending on your left or right. Reality show has nothing to do with reality. I feel documentaries are kind of the last place where you can really get at the truth. So I want to know what your thoughts are on that, you, especially you, Roy, like why you got behind CJ to do this. Besides, you know, he's great and, and he looks, you know... Uh, fine as hell. You were using the word, you were searching for the words fine as hell. I was searching for the words, right? <laughs> the, the issue, I guess, for me was... At The Daily Show, we're really only able to delve into why something happened or what the solution is. We don't have enough time to do both. And this documentary was an opportunity to do just that. And the thing that I didn't know, and this stuff had been shot before CJ had brought it to me, was also his own exploration into self and his own identity and his own relationship with Blackness before going out and discovering all of this anti-blackness that was happening, you know, across the country. Um, I, I'm thankful that streamers exist and they allow stories to be told with a degree of nuance. We would not have this plethora of documentaries if we did not have all of these plethora of avenues for them to be distributed upon. Because I'm old enough to remember in my day, documentary day was Sunday. Yeah. That was the day. If you was going to watch something heavy, it either came on at like 11 o'clock in the morning after Charles Corral, if you didn't want to watch football, <laughs> or on either side of 60 minutes would be the heavy stuff. And then every February, they would show Roots on PBS over the course of That's right. you know four or five days. You got your knowledge in these specific blocks if the documentary was in tune with the time. Like you would get your MLK docs in January. You would get all your wokey woke women's rights stuff in the spring. And, and like now you can have anything about anyone, about any time period at any time, and you can go and find that stuff. I also think to a degree, you know, there are a lot of opinions about movies that portray black pain. And there are a lot of opinions about the creators who use black pain to further their message and profit, blah, 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 blah. Because of the blatant erasure mm. of black history within our textbooks, the history has to exist somewhere. And the documentaries are important. But I also believe that to a degree, some of this scripted stuff from black creators whether you label it problematic or not, for me is a something better than nothing proposition because that's also going to reach some of the people who may not want to sit and watch a documentary. Ava DuVernay's the 13th. It's not funny. It no. wasn't supposed <laughs> to be. <laughs> it was, it's powerful. It did what it was supposed to do, right. but we also have to respect how people absorb information a number of different ways. Everybody doesn't learn the same. Everybody doesn't listen to this. That's why certain school teachers vibe with you better than others, because it's how they deliver the message. And I think, you can create a documentary and, and call yourself a journalist, but to a degree, you are an educator. And I think that's part of where, you know, at CJ, I don't even remember what grade you taught in New Orleans public schools, but middle school, sixth grade. So you got to be, you got to have a little pizzazz <laughs> yeah. to them. You can't Ben yeah, Stein, yeah. Ferris Bueller, that shit. No. Mm -mm. Personality. Mm -mm. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I, I agree. I agree with Roy. We got to go pop culture. We got to go pop on this, right? Like my goal was to make a deep, heavy documentary that that is unsparing in how how many details it has about how white supremacy built itself into our country. But I wanted to make it fun as hell. You know, I wanted to make it accessible. Movies change history. Uh, Gone with the Wind rewrote an entire generation's memory of the past. Yes. More people know Gone with the Wind than they know actual history. Right, like Gone with the Wind changed race relations in a way in a way that we have been unable to do about when people think about the past. Birth of a Nation was single handedly responsible for the rebirth of the KKK. So we gotta bring our game hard to be able to combat those movies. The the generations of filmmakers now need to be making stuff that can undo what those movies have done, 
And there, you know, there are articles now that are like, yo, where are all the black people who make civil war movies? And one of them is right here. And, and, and that, and our goal is to try to basically like flip what the UDC did in this film. You see that the United Daughters of the Confederacy were successful at changing all of our textbooks by, by funding uh, film monuments and uh, getting, getting their narratives in textbooks. So you bet my focus is on having a fun, harrowing film that kids rock with and that any teacher can put on and be like, welcome to history class, even if your governor is making your books illegal. Yeah, they're like their own national endowment of the arts. It's like... It's insane what they've done. Yeah. Who would you say is your 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 target audience? Do you want? Do you think this is more important for white people to see, or for black people to see? What, what's your thought on that? Who who do you want to see it, and what would you like them to get out of it? I would. For me, you know, and CJ made the film, but for me, it's the white people. You know, kind of at thirty five and under, the ones you still might be able to flip, and the ones whose minds haven't been completely molded into something that believes the lie you know to me those are the people i'm not sure how much you can you can rehabilitate or permeate the mind of someone who still shows up to confederate war reenactments i don't know if you can do anything for them but that 12 year old or that eight year old or that 17 year old who doesn't have a lot of black friends because of where they grow up they could see something like this and maybe it could help just make you question what you've been taught. Just at least question it. I want to take you back to like the feeling of that we felt in 2020 of that outrage about being like, white people, what are you doing? When are you talking to your other white people about all the shit y'all need to talk about to fix this, right? Like we are doing this, but, but you need to do your work. And that feeling was what I was feeling when I started making this film. So much years, years of making this film was about like, this film is for white people and I don't feel bad about it. This film is for white people who will not face the truth. Will you face the truth now that you see it in the documents? No. Will you face the truth now that we show you footage of people getting their necks nailed on in 2016? No. Will you see it now that you've seen people executed in front of you in 2020? No, right? So like part of me making this film is like white people, what does it take to make you see the truth? I used to have a note card on my bulletin board as motivation that said, to make them see. That was my motivation. We got to make these white people to make them see. I'm not talking about all white people, but I'm certainly not talking about black people. Black people are not the ones who are like, I don't know if white supremacy exists. I then replaced that note card with this that says, to see ourselves. That is the change. You make a film for five years, almost six, eventually, and you start off trying to make white people see, eventually you're like, what kind of film is just trying to make white people see the thing that they haven't seen <laughs> for centuries? So for, for me now, the, the final edit of the film, what, what you are seeing is a film that is not just about trying to make white people confront white supremacy, but it's trying to make non-white people feel powerful. It's trying to make non-white people remember, feel that your, your reality is validated, that, that the sense of outrage that you have about the past and the stuff that is still happening is right, and that we're showing you a whole film over five years about what black and brown people have been able to do together to change their world. We're not waiting for monuments to come down. We're out there just pulling them down, right? Like we're, we're out there trying to defund police departments. So I want white folks to feel responsible and, and, and held to task and black folks to feel powerful. Thank you so much. The name of the movie is called The Neutral Ground. You could watch it on PBS and on POV.org. Roy Wood Jr., CJ Hunt. Thank you all. That's it for this 55th episode of Brown and Black. I'd like to thank CJ Hunt and Roy Wood Jr. for joining the show. And if you would like to support this podcast, please subscribe and leave a review. Your help will allow us to be heard by many more people. This episode was edited by Joshua Tirado. You can follow our comments and opinions on at Brown Black Podcasts on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. You're also going to be checking out this interview on our YouTube channel. We'll see you on the next episode of Brown and Black.